are you and where are we? And tell me a little bit about your, your, your dance history background. Well, my formal name for all of this has been Kate Van Winkle Keller. And I married Bob and it became Kate Keller. And when I first published that Keller and Sweet book, I said to myself, Kate Keller is not a very appealing name. And so I added my father's name. And he was Rip Van Winkle. Uh, of course, he was called Rip. His real name was Edward, but that's beside the point. And so I became Kate Van Winkle Keller. Okay. But to you and my friends, Kitty Keller is easier. <laughs> and how did you get started in your interest in dance history? The initial impulse for it was really the bicentennial. But there was a second impulse, and that was that we had moved into Bob's family home in Connecticut, which had been built in 1801, between 1801 and 1804, uh, as a tavern. And a tavern in that period had to have a ballroom, or a room in which to have parties and uh, Masonic meetings and dances. And at the same time, my kids joined the Fife and Drum Corps in Coventry, Connecticut. So one day, Joy Van Cleef walked in. She had a... Uh, Persian lamb coat, white gloves, and here are all these fifers and drummers, filthy, you know, sweating up a storm, and she wants to know about tunes for these dances that she had in manuscript. And Ralph Sweet was there, he was teaching fife, and his son was teaching fife, and so he looked at them, and I was there because my kids were there, and Ralph looked at these tune at these dances. He said, we, we have those tunes, no problem. We get them in five books and all over the place. And so I, I got started with the two of them looking for more information about these tunes and these dances. And I went to the library, just the local public library, and what do I find? Um, virtually nothing. I found the country dance book, Tolman Page. I found um, that, that dreadful big history, Sox's history, the world history of the dance, nothing. Then I went to the Historical Society, and I ran into a manuscript from 1777 that had the tunes in it. And, and no, one, no one had been looking at it. Nobody had been, they didn't even know what they had. It was sitting on a, it wasn't even in the catalog, it just was there. And then as I looked at through this manuscript, I, I, was so excited because when I get excited, I really get excited. And I went to the head of the Historical Society and I said, do you realize what you've got? This is 1974. The Bicentennial is coming. But people in this kind of outfit need to have something for the Bicentennial, but they didn't have anything yet because they couldn't think of anything yet. And I said, do you realize what you have here? He said, those tunes look interesting. Let me take it. He took me upstairs. He showed me a tall clock that played the same tunes. And it was from the same neighborhood as the little manuscript had been made. So obviously, this one thing led to an F. This is the Giles Gibbs book, which was the first thing we issued. And it was a bicentennial project of the Connecticut Historical Society. And that one thing led to another. And I worked with Ralph. And we began to work with Joy. And we found American tunes, American dances. And we began to put American stuff on the stage instead of the Apted book, which was what CDS was using as bicentennial dances. So that's the story of the beginning of a lifetime of fun, just fun. What was your particular, your own background? I mean, what's, what's Let me ask you something. Well, just do you want me to look there, or do you want me to look you at you? Look at okay, because that's what I'm not yeah. sure about. My background? Yeah, I mean, that sort of gave you the skills or the intellectual oh. apparatus to do all this. <laughs> I must say, everything I learned, I learned at the Oxford School in West Hartford. <laughs> but I did go to Vassar College, and I was a major in music and art, which helped a lot. I did a lot of singing. Um, singing voice was really my instrument when I majored in music. So uh, I also participated in, in opera productions and, and sang quite a bit after college, too. Um, I guess I was outfitted at Vassar with the ability to find information that I needed. I was outfitted at, in, high, in high school by really good writing teachers. 
So I think the two of those came together. But, but anyone who does anything like this needs great editors. And as I got deeper into this and I began to find manuscripts, it was the manuscript material that I turned up, thanks to Bob. He would go off to inspect the plant. And while he was there, he would drop in at the local historical society and look to see if they had any dance manuscripts or music manuscripts. And eventually, I became the only one who knew about all these American tune books. So the Music Library Association asked to publish my list, and so I had a wonderful editor there. And one thing led to another, and I, had, I was asked to write things, and I had really good editors. And it, it's been an accumulation of learning. Uh, people teaching me how to look for things simply by helping, librarians helping. Yeah, and then I also, very right almost from the beginning, I became associated. First of all, I went up to, uh, this kind of mixed up, but um, we'll straighten it out later. I went, when I found the Gibbs manuscript, I went up to Old Sturbridge Village, where I had been going regularly to find more information about our house, because it was of the period of, so of Sturbridge Village. So um, I met Art Schrader up there. He was the music um, man at, at Old Sturbridge Village. And when he found out about the Gibbs manuscript, he was the one who supported me in it. He showed me the basic books. He really guided me getting started. And then he also introduced me to a group of music uh, professors and people interested in music called the Sonic Society. They've now become the Society for American Music. But I joined immediately and quickly got deep into this group of people, which was absolutely wonderful because there again, it was a support system. Yep. It was fellow, I mean, we're all fellow working, yeah. it, totally fellow, fellow enthusiasts fellow. who were working towards the bicentennial. And um, in order to do that, we, we kind of had to work together because everybody was doing little things. And it, was the, it was the combination of what this one was doing and that was doing. Uh, Barbara Lambert was in the society. She found out what I was doing. She asked me to write an article, and Joy and I wrote an article that appeared in her really big book from Colonial, uh, Colonial, Colonial Society of Massachusetts published it. That was a big feather in my cap to be, to be in that book, and our article started the book. So that was a major breakthrough. Then the, the Music Library Association uh, taking on my stuff and it just grew and grew and grew. So it, it, that was pretty much what it was. Um, I got really started in looking for tunes. I mean, as you could tell, from the very beginning, I was looking for tunes. So I'm, I'm the tune one. The dance just came because it was a big hollow there. Nobody was working on it. And so I worked on the dance just sort of on the side, but I was really looking for tunes. And in my work for looking for tunes with the Sonic Society, we developed a project called the National Tune Index, which was funded by the NEH. And um, that was published almost within six months. The NEH couldn't believe it. They love my project. <laughs> they, they get <laughs> because done. I, they get done. They get done. And not only that, since then, Bob has taken, here we go, here with the clocks. Right. <laughs> Talking about we'll, things we'll that you. There. Yeah. So, so. The, the question that obviously comes is, all right, so there you are with Revolutionary War era stuff. What took you back into English country dance and Playford Ball and English yeah. dance and tune? What took me into the Playford Ball is a very interesting story. And it's been shared. <laughs> but it's a very interesting story. Obviously, when you find American dances, and you say, okay, here we've got these things, and we've got American manuscripts with these tunes in them. Guess what? What people were saying was, oh, well, you know, it's American. It's not English. It's American because we were America. And we started to look around, and we said, yeah, but you know what? This stuff's all over the place in England. These, th these are not... Uh, American compositions. These are English compositions. So our first article was called The English Sources of American Country Dance. So obviously, you've got to go backwards. And of course, then the other thing was Bob and I started dancing. We went to Pinewoods. Joy and Frank got us to Pinewoods. We were there when, um, uh, oh boy, Pat Shaw. Pat Shaw. We were there when Pat Shaw came. 
we couldn't have been. I, I, I swear there is something up there that guides us, and things happen as they should. Not only Pat Shaw, but Chip Hendrickson were there. And I was a total newbie. They put us in the beginning class, although we knew what we were doing because we had been taking dancing from Joy and Frank. But they put us in the beginning class, and I sat around and I just listened to what was going on at Pinewoods that year, 74. And, and uh, Chip did too. And we met later, and we said, you know what? There's something more to the American dance. There's a lot more to the American dance. The more we realized how deeply dance is embedded in the social life of the people, the more we realized that we could not take what we saw in the manuscripts and just put them out like Cecil Sharp had us dancing, which was what CDS was doing, because they didn't have anything else. And so they, they were just walking around, like, and, and Chip and I began to work on the steps. And we began to work on the dances as they were danced by what kind of people. Was it the fifers and drummers in their camp? Okay, they're doing to do it one way. If, was it George Washington and his officers? They're going to do it entirely differently. And so that was where we really started forging a path of our own. This was not popular. And it was very much not popular. And as a matter of fact, Ralph himself said, no, you're going to kill it off. You don't want to do all those fancy steps. Well, Chip and I pursued and persisted. But we did say, look, we don't want to mess with the old stuff. Let's, you know, leave that alone. There were other people also who were saying, you know, now that we've taken a look, and this is where Pat comes in, we, we really need to rethink some of these interpretations that, that we're growing up with, with Cecil Sharp. And he had apparently done this lots, lots earlier than 74. He was, he was rocking. So all of this was at a, at a period when everything was sort of up for grabs. And so I had to go back, and, and I think I became the bête noire of the whole business. Um, I don't, uh, uh, Pat was the real guy to blame, but I was the other guy to blame. And CDS kind of backed off from me, that, you know, she's ruining what we're doing. Because the because, on steps was making it different. Because steps is making it different. And I wasn't trying to change. And, and, but, but I was insisting that we look at the sources. Don't take it from a, an interpretation. Let's not get it out of socks. Let's not get it out of sharp. We've got the sources. Let's go to the sources. That's what Pat was saying. And, and we were finding the same thing with the American sources. Once we began to find these manuscripts, they kind of kept coming. I have a shelf in there. I, I don't know how many hundreds of tune books I have. And uh, we developed the, the bibliography of American dance in manuscript. And found, we found all kinds of things. And so we have the sources now. We don't need to have somebody else's interpretation. Well, there was such a kind of a kerfuffle, <laughs> that um, the, see, it was a Princeton, uh, Princeton Book Company asked me to write a book call, uh, on the play for dances as CBS did it. In other words, would you be willing to write a book of the CDS repertory, the sharp repertory? And of course I thought, why me? And well, I guess they figured if I did that, then it would maybe solve some of these issues. Well, of course, I wasn't qualified to write a book about CD of country dances, so I got Jenny. And Jenny at first said, no way. You, uh, you, you know, I don't want to have any part of what you're doing. Yeah. I said to Jenny, Jenny, this is a celebration of the sharp tradition, and that's terribly important. There's nothing wrong with the sharp way of doing things. Absolutely nothing. They're beautiful dances. We still dance them. We love them. We do more sharp here than we do anything else. And 
this is a celebration of the sharp tradition. Let's identify it as a tradition. We don't need to say it's good or bad or anything. It's itself. And so we can safely take a second look at Playford, but we're not going to hurt the tradition. And that's where the Playford ball came from. I gave it that name with my tongue in my cheek, needless to say, because, you know, the, as I just read something about somebody who was complaining about calling them Playford balls. I think it was Thurston. Uh, said, you know, you call them Playford balls. What are you dancing? You're dancing at the dances, most of them. You're not dancing from the Playford, from the dancing master. Playford, the name, has been misused. We, we call it the dancing master when we're talking about yeah. that period. So that was pretty much where the Playford ball came from. Interesting. I, I had always imagined that Jenny brought you in as the sort of tune expert. No, so. no. I was design. I did the design. I did the entire layout of that book. That's been my other job that I've been doing recently is designing books and producing books. So most of my stuff I've designed myself. My, my uh, big dance history was they did that and they did a beautiful job. But most of the rest of the stuff I designed myself. So that was what I did. I pasted it up. It was before the days oh, yeah. of computer. I had to cut type it up, cut and paste, and paste in. And some of the pictures got mixed up when they took and pictured it, did it. So the second edition had to come out. It's still in print. Oh, yeah. yeah. We were working on steps. Um, Chip and I had gotten started at Fine Woods together because I had never met him and I met him there. And we both lived in Connecticut so we could get together and share stuff and I gave him a lot of the copies of things that I had, tunes and dances and that sort of stuff. And the more we talked, the more, I, I just remember getting together once and playing Flowers of Edinburgh and we were dancing just around in the dining room and he said, yeah, play it slower and let's do some of these steps. And so we did, and Joy was teaching us because Wendy was teaching Joy. Wendy Hilton was there behind the scenes and we had access to her through Joy. So she came to visit Joy regularly. This was back in the 78, 78, 79 period. Her book came out in 80 and she was very close to having finalized what she felt in the way of how these steps should be performed. So she was teaching them to us or teaching them to Joy, and Joy was teaching them us, and Frank was sitting in the background saying, oh, I don't like those steps, you're going to kill it all, because he, he was a sharpie from the beginning. But Joy was willing to listen to all this stuff. Wendy said, I want you to write the history of American dance for me, for, my, for Pendragon. And I said, okay, I will, but I've got to get all these other things done. And so that was the beginning, and I had been collecting information on dance for all since 74, I had been amassing Xeroxes of various things. I don't have any originals. Well, I have a couple of originals, but I don't have, you know, a lot, a lot, not like what Bill Litchman has, some of the real things, and you go down to his library and you say, oh my God, this is what, but having Xeroxes, you can mark on them, uh, you can use them, you can Xerox them again, uh, you can really work with them. So I collect Xeroxes. And um, by then I had a lot of stuff, and I was, I was, really steaming on, on all of this. And so when Wendy asked me to write the book, I said, okay, but it's going to have to wait, for, get in line. Then the, the, the best thing, as I say, these things tend to, to happen, was the Sonic Society was, by then I was on the board of the Sonic Society and eventually I was the executive director f until for about 23 years I was on the board and, and helped keep the society running. <clears throat> We had a project reading early American newspapers, which was falling, and uh, people just, you know, didn't have time, blah, 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 blah. So I said, okay, we, I'll come, and I'll do it, and I'll work on it. And so we got, again, NEH, went to the NEH. They said, sure, we love things that Kate Keller does, so we'll fund you. So for five years, Bob and I and several other people read newspapers. And I said, okay, Wendy, I can write this book, but not until I finish the newspaper project, because it was amazing, this material that came out of that project. Dancing Masters ads, ads for uh, cotillion books, <laughs> talk about square dancing. Um, I can tell you exactly when uh, the first country, uh, cotillions were taught in America, because the, uh, the Dancing Master advertised in the paper and said he was teaching them. And it was just a wonderful, wonderful body of work. So that came out in 97. At that point, I began to really work on the book. Um, and I finished it after I moved here, relieved of the housework that I had to do back home, and then I could get it done. And it turned out to be enormous, 714 pages with 1,600 footnotes. But it was, um, and bless his heart, Bob Kessler didn't cut a word. 
he published everything I wrote. And I threw in everything. And that book was not edited. <laughs> so it maybe should have been, but if it had been, things would have been lost. Yeah. And that's what's so neat about that book. It's got everything in it that I could find. So that's, that's the story of what happened. <laughs> so. Okay. So, I mean, you, you, you talked about how with the American dance and the revolution, you know, you realize, well, there's more to this. So that's sort of the situation we're in with the squares. Yeah. Right. So let's 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 start with the let's get one thing out of the way. The yeah. whole notion. Well, English country dance, you look at the figures of you know, early Playford, bless his heart, has a wonderful variety. It's not this long ways for as many as will it's what, a third of the dances of first edition are yeah. long ways. And you have well, and those are different long ways. E exactly. Okay. Right. And okay. and then you have the squares and the rounds and the two couple and people look at that and say, Well look, it's squares and yeah. clearly that's where American square dance comes from. So talk a little bit about that <laughs> okay. English country dance. First being of a all <clears throat> Yeah. First of all, no no history is linear. Nothing comes directly from anything. And although you might find hints of something here and hints of something there, you come hints of something there, and you may say, Oh, that's that's the ur, that's the ur. It just doesn't work that way. Dance is a creature of the people who dance it. It's a social activity danced by friends, people who are together because they like each other, they like each other's company. So obviously certain peoples are going to come together. You're going to have, say, in an army, you're going to have the officers and the leading people in town. In a court, you're going to have the king and his people. And, and in a village, you're going to have the squire might come down and bring his daughters to dance. And they all dance differently. The early Playford books were created for a very special group of people. They were created for people that liked to dance in an intimate environment. They did not dance in dance halls. Dance halls hadn't been thought of yet. You, you cannot equate the spaces in which dances are danced with what kind of dance they dance. Long ways dances were not created because long ballrooms became into effect. Long ballrooms happened because people suddenly needed more space because there were more people dancing. But back to Playford. There's little dances in there. Mm -hmm. The long ways dances that are there almost entirely are danced very differently. They are danced by the first couple, the first figure, to the bottom and back. Then the second figure, to the bottom and back. This is not the classic progressive dance that we know of today. So you have to remember that those dances were danced by very small groups, very elite groups. They had to be practiced, most of them, before they could dance them. They didn't, they, and they all took dancing lessons. Dancing lessons in England have been offered since before Shakespeare. We have, we, I was just reading about a fellow named Firth who was teaching dancing in, in England in 1516. I couldn't believe it. So the English needed to learn how to dance back then. And obviously you had to have money to learn how to dance, which meant the money separated the people who could dance. Okay. Now, English society changed between 1650 and 1750. By around 1700, or a little bit before, they, had, they call it the commercialization of leisure. Suddenly, there were a lot of people who could afford to buy these lessons in dancing. And once they bought them, they wanted to show off what they had learned. So it, they could show it off with their friends, but that wasn't good enough. Suddenly, they, they demanded spaces and places to dance. And that's where you begin to get public assemblies in the early 1700s, 1700s, yes. And in America, it wasn't far behind England. In 1732, there was a public assembly in Boston and a public assembly in New York. And they were vying for who is better. But these were generally the people who could afford the dance because it was a commercial thing. Dancing became a commercial thing. 
and also dancing, because it was something you could buy, separated you from the rest of the world. It became a, a commodity which you could show who you were in society with, through your dancing. And it, let's see, I've got to stop there. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, and what happened with the dances at that point was the dances changed to accommodate the people. Suddenly, there were too many people wanting easier, slightly easier dances because these people were not the elites. And, and there were too many people, there were more people who wanted to dance, and the dances had to change. That's when they changed, they dropped these old, hard to do dances. And they became a long ways dance that you could start at the top, and the top couple could choose the dance and then show how it was done with the next couple. And then dance it down. And generally, initially, the whole set watched while the first couple did it. Now, the first couple had to choose several things. They had to tell the musicians what the music was. Well, they didn't tell the musicians directly. They told the manager of the dance. And then they also had to select the steps they, to, to perform the figures. Not only did they know the figures, but they had to know what steps to do. And this comes out. In, in, in Dancing Master's ads, that's how we know. The steps were critical. Now, about the same time, you, we're, we're thinking about square dancing here. About the same time, the same thing was happening in France. Only they didn't like the long ways dances. When, when Lorraine went over there and brought back the English long ways dances, it was such a foreign idea to the French that he had to make a second manuscript, which took Christchurch Bells in agonizing detail. Every single figure, four, four couples dancing, he got the top couple down to the bottom and back to the top in 150 pages. That's how long it took. Now, he put in the steps, and he also said, the English don't do any regular steps with their dancing. Well, what he meant, what he was really saying was, they don't have dancing masters who are prescribing the steps like we do. They're just doing any steps. They weren't doing no steps. They were doing any steps of their own choice. And, and of course, this is where people say, well, the English were just walking around. Well, no, the English didn't just walk around. Not in court, not in any place, a public assembly. My God, you would not. When you started with a minuet, you think you'd just turn around and walk around with the country dances? No way. It just doesn't happen that way. So in France, what happened, they took the non-progressive square and, and it became the, the, the dance of the day. And that was when the contradance started. The contradance, the, there is no evidence that the contradance, although the figures are somewhat, some of the figures look like play for figures. They, yet we have grand squares in contradance, which is great. We have grand squares in Hudson House. Think about it. You can only do so many things with eight people, or with four people, or with two people. You can arm, you can take hands, you can do this and that and the other thing. There's only so much to do. So it's possible that somebody found a book and got the idea, but I don't think so, because they weren't drawn in figures. They were said in words, and it was in English anyway. Nobody would have paid. Nobody can you talk a little it. bit about Laurent? And, and oh, yeah, his, Laurent. I mean, his, his trip to England and bringing the dances back. You mentioned him, but many people... Yeah, let's, let's, let's get to Laurent. Um, the only contact that we know of that happened between the French and the English in dance in the early days was that somebody had gone back to France and had told the people that they were doing these cool dances. He, he liked them. These were, this was in uh, 1685 or 84. No, it was earlier than Laurent. It was eight, around 1680. And they were doing these cool dances that, that uh, he had learned in England. And so the king, Louis XIV, now we think that he sent a spying group over. We think, at least I think, that Laurent was, a, um, was really a cover. But he was sent by Louis XIV to study the English dance. And then he went back to bring it back to show the king what he had learned about the latest stuff from England. 
and he so he he made a little manuscript and he has several dances and they're all dedicated to members of the court with very very appropriate uh, dances selected for them. Christ Church bells for the king, of course, to flatter the king and all this and this sort of stuff. And he taught, he, he apparently taught these dances to the court. He also put in a couple of his own dances, which were not progressive. These, the, the dances that he taught, that he brought from England, were definitely the progressive dances. So he introduced the court to the English country dance, progressive and these are dance. All long ways. They are long ways dances. The way we do say Christchurch bells, which is in his second manuscript. So we know that the court learned how to do from Lorrain. I think the court quickly forgot. Our, they just decided this wasn't going to be much fun because you don't see any more evidence. There are French books which carry some of the um, English country dance titles in them. So the English country dances were being done. Uh, Jean Quiso, well, the ones that are in Feuillet, Jean Quiso, Lily Bolero, a few of the others that, that Longrand brought over uh, did seem to be uh, available in Europe. And they do show up in manuscripts, the tunes. You can find the tunes. You won't find the dances, but you can find the tunes. And then in, in the Feuillet book in 1700, I think, um, he's got a whole bunch of English country dances. So I shouldn't say the French forgot about them. The French did continue to do the English country dance, the long ways English country dance. But I don't think it took particularly because it didn't last into the 18th century. This was all between, uh, Laurent went over in 1688, uh, 1685. He, pub he gave his book to the king in 86, 87, 88 pieces. So um, there was evidently an interest in what was going on in England in dance, in Europe, and in France, and in and other countries too, I believe. So the country dances in France, what kind of, what, what was French dancing at that point? I mean, I mean, how did the English country dance fit into the French Well, dance? they were doing, uh, well, it's hard to know, because in 1688 we don't have a lot of, of stuff. Uh, beginning in 1700, we do have these wonderful balls, uh, ball dances by Pecor and, and, uh, and the other dancing masters that are all choreographed, completely choreographed. We do know from what was going on in the court uh, with Louis XIV that they were doing completely choreographed ballets, absolutely incredible ballets. They were doing brawls, they were doing courants, they were doing a lot of the old, old dances from the 17th, the 17th century social dances. But they were, they were very hierarchical, and, and, and the king, the idea of the king standing second to anybody in a court is not going to happen. So I don't, you know, the, obviously the country dances didn't stick, because he would not, Louis XIV would have not been a second couple. So I, we don't see anything except that there was this thing called cotillion, or cotillon, cotillon in that period, because it emerges in 1708, I think it is, in one of the Feuillet books. It is a chorus figure dance. It has a specific chorus that is done, and then the figure keeps changing, and then, and then you go back and do the chorus, and you figure, and a new figure, and then a chorus, and a new figure. That's the germ of what became the contradance, and eventually the cotillion, and eventually the square dance. So let's talk. It's so the, complicated. But it is. I just I mean, I, and I. I spent years sending notes to people saying, I mean, on basics, I don't understand the difference between quadrilles and cotillions. And right. I finally got that straight. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So let's and they even called them quadrilles occasionally right. because they were squares. Right. So, what what I need to see before I can say anything happened is I want to see the primary evidence. I want to see it written down. So we looked at this, and we have in Feuillet, we have something called cotillon. And apparently, from the literature that, uh, bless her heart, uh, Allison has turned up, that was kind of a dirty joke. It was a sexy joke. That's where the petticoat thing comes in. The petticoat thing is not, has nothing to do with the dance. It has to do with the word. It's nothing to do with the dance. You didn't do a dance with petticoats. So, but there was a dance. It was in, now in the case of the early one, only four people. 
So somebody who is a little um, careless could say, oh, well, that goes back to Parsons' Farewell. No, I don't think so. There were a lot of dances that were done. There were court dances that were fully choreographed with steps in the whole nine yards. And the figure was all worked out and drawn out. And, and these, now I shouldn't say lots because we don't have that many of them, but I believe we have, uh, the figure that sticks in my mind is 300. Choreographed dances from this period, from the Louis XIV period, from the beginning of the uh, Royal Academy of the Dance, uh, which is in the 60s, 1660, to 18, 1725, that period. We have, I think, 300 choreographed dances. So there was really an interest in France in choreographing really beautiful dances for one, two, four, six, eight, ten, you name it, whatever. There's a book that came over here that has dances for all women in different groups with figures all spelled out in around 1700. So those dances, that, that book was brought to America and it was being taught by a dancing master here. So we have a body of literature that we can look at. So the only thing in there that looks anything like a square dance is this one by Fouillet. Then there is a gap. And what fills that gap is the contenance, which is what I discovered just today. The contenance, the, the square, contenance this is the contenance francaise. Well, they only called it the contenance. And when, when Laurent spelled contradance, uh, country, uh, contra dance, he spelled it D-A-N-C-E. He did not spell it D-A-N-S-E. So he knew there was a difference between what he was bringing from England and what the French were doing, evidently, because he didn't spell it the way the French spelled their contradance. Evidently, what be be happened is the opera balls began to happen, again, like the assemblies in England, like the assemblies in America. People wanted to dance. They wanted to dance. If the king was present and would dance, then, the, I mean, these were top elite, 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 elite people. They would dance. And at the opera balls, which were masked balls, they danced the French contredance, in between dancing Le Marie, Le Bourguignon, and Le Van uh, Amable, Le Vainqueur, and those couple dances they would dance a square. And those are the French country dances. And the difference between uh, the way they did those things, we know because in 62, 1762, de la Cuisse gathered them all together, hundreds and hundreds of these things, and he published them in small livres where there were only four pages. It would just You think of a page with four images on it, and you could fold it up and it would become a little book. And they would, he'd give the front page, which had the title of the dance, then he'd have the dance figures, then he'd have the dance music, and then he'd have a couplet about the dance. The French contradances always had a, a song that went with them. Whether they sang it while they danced, I don't think so, because with all those rigadoons and, and steps you couldn't sing, I don't think you'd run out of breath. But in any case, so, all right. What these have that the country dance, the English country dance, do not have, is an opening honor to your partner, an opening ring, and a closing sequence. Now, how does the square dance start? Honor your partner, honor your corner, and often some kind of a circle thing. To me, that's a direct link, and it didn't come from Playford. It came from these contradances that, that the French developed for the court to dance in their opera balls. And apparently those were really big, and, and we have massive numbers of these things in De La Cuisse. And in England, I guess they just weren't interested for quite a long time, partly because they were very difficult to, to share. It wasn't until La Cuisse, I, this is my feeling, until La Cuisse figured out a way to write them out, because there's nothing, we have nothing in between of how to write these things out. Um, in 62, he wrote them out and he published this massive collection. And is he doing it with diagrams? Diagrams, absolutely with diagrams. We should Similar get. Similar to Fouillet? Yeah, that well, that? Not, not that detail of, of Fouillet. Diagrams, figure diagrams. Okay. In my book, there's some samples. You can get them out of there. We can, yeah. They're up on um, DLC line. 
Um, anyway, that's worth looking at. Just look at, and, and at the beginning of his book, he tells you the steps you should be using for these things. They are simpler, obviously, because if groups and groups of people, and again, things did get simpler as the 19th century, 18th century went on, because there were more and more people who wanted to consume them. And the more people you have, uh, you know, it's going to get watered down. You don't have just the king and his court anymore. And they can, they can get all these incredible steps. You look into Wendy's book and you see the kinds of details that the king and the, the court had to learn. It just doesn't want to work when you get down to the upper middle classes who were consuming the dance and using it for status and using it for place in society and that sort of thing. So, so you get to Laquise, then in 68, a new kind of French dance is introduced in England. Well, what are you going to call it? You know, it, it became called Cotillion. Now, Galini published a uh, Cotillion collection, and it was basically the, the French contredance sort of boiled down in, that's the 62. And in, in 70, the dancing masters in, in 68 and 69, that's when you get it in the newspaper. Suddenly, the, the dancing masters are saying, we're going to teach this new English, or new French dance called the Cotillon. And then it became Cotillion simply because that was an English way of doing it. But the complicating factor here, and in America, it was only a couple years later that the first one was in Charleston, naturally Charleston. They were way ahead of everybody as far as classy, classy things. I mean, they, the Charleston people were closer to the court of England than anybody. Uh, they had plenty of money and plenty of time to, to learn how to dance, and they really did it. So they're, they're the first ones in 70, 72, I think. Maybe it's 70. I can't remember exactly. But it was introduced as the brand new, and he was just teaching the new French contredance or cotillion. Now, the complicating thing is the word cotillion has carried through the entire 18th century as having to do with English, with French dances. This is where it's very hard. This is where, as Allison said, my head hurts. Until we have a little bit more, and I'm hoping that this book by, uh, by Richard Simmons will help us with this, until we have more evidence, more hard stuff, we'll begin to sort these things out because this, this Figure, we, we call it a figure chorus dance. Uh, this figure chorus dance seemed to be what Feuillet had in mind when he put the cotillion in his book. And then the figure chorus dances that, Des, uh, that <laughs> Lacuisse published were definitely the same kind of thing, only much, much, much more elaborate. And then it comes out the other end as cotillions. Now, for the English, of course, it's easier. In, call it a cotillion. Don't call it a French cotillion. We can't pronounce that. But we can pronounce cotillion, and that's what... In the music books, for some reason, all, all the French music books that I've been to collect, and I've got quite a few, they have a lot of cotillions, tunes called cotillion. Lots of them. And I don't think I've seen any tune called contredance. So... This is where the puzzlement has been. I, I don't know where these came from. The tunes in La Cuisse all come from the theater. The theatrical connection is enormous in the, early, the history of the early contradans. They were very theatrical. They, in England, at the end of shows, the company generally, the actors generally did a country dance. In France, at the end of shows, the company might do a contredans. But the trouble with the contradance is that everybody's facing in. It doesn't make a very good audience presentation kind of thing. The country dance, you can have the ladies facing the audience so that, and the men's back to the audience, and it's not quite so bad as a presentation dance. They did it somehow. So both theater traditions had dance at the end and had dance throughout in, in any case. But the, the contradance apparently was part of the theater, and most of the contradances in the, in the Laquis book come from the theater. The tunes. Yeah. And that's all on the front pages. So, this is research in progress. The one thing we can be very sure of, the Playford style dances never went very far and are very unlikely to have influenced 
the development of the contradance. I think the, the contradance came out of the theatrical tr the, and court tradition of dancing, which was very much focused on patterns, symmetrical patterns, and stepping. That, that was what was valued in the performers, was their ability to perform the, the patterns and, and do the right steps. And the theatrical in England, when you look at, at the Bray's dances, which are highly theatrical. Exactly, um, exactly. So yeah. that's sort of the English equivalent. Yeah, of, of theatrical dances, yeah. 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 I haven't worked too much on that. Yeah. Well, just yeah. Remember his first name. Right. <laughs> but we worked hard on that book. <laughs> so, so to go back, yeah. when, when, you, when you talked about um, Cotillon, where do we think that came from? In French, French society, dancing masters created this dance, which they called Cotillon. But based on what? Mr. I Mr. don't know. Because at that point, what because they were doing... You have to rephrase that. Oh, yes, that's right. Co the, the, the Cotillon that Fouillet published in, I think it was 08, 1708, was a two-couple dance. And it had very elaborate... Um, Drawings is exactly where the couples went and, and the couple went and did things. I'm not sure it had very many steps, but because for some reason the cotillon wasn't quite as fussed about as Le Marié, for instance, which at every step was choreographed. So when Pécourt and Desay and, and Feuillet published those ball dances for the French court, they were choreographed to within an arm and leg of their of their uh, figure. This cotillon was not choreographed stepwise quite as much. So there is some hint that this fell in the same bowl as what Feuillet was also doing, which was taking advantage of the public's fascination with the English country dance, where he published a whole book of them. And that's Jean Quissot, Lily Bolero, uh, the, the, the Manche Vert, you know, are the classic dances that Feuillet published in 1700. So he was sort of interested in this. And that may be where that, that idea of putting, but those were long ways dances. So if he married the idea of his court dances in his mind with the idea of two people doing a chorus figure dance. I mean, that's the only thing I can think of. So is that coming out of the brawl? Is there I don't know enough about those dances. Yeah. Whether the chorus and figure dances, I don't think so. Okay. The brawl is not a chorus and figure yeah. dance. Um, none of the dances that, that I know, and I'm... <laughs> <laughs> very tenuous. You know, I, this has been a long time since I've even thought about some of this stuff. Um, I don't, I, now again, there are people we can talk to about whether there are Renaissance and early Baroque antecedents for a figure chorus dance. That would be a, a way to go. Somebody said, talk, talk about it, see if you can find it. Because it clearly has a figure or a, a, a thing that's going to be repeated, yes, and then yes, a figure. So talk, talk about that structure. Well, okay, the way that dance worked this was, this is the cotillon of, de, of Feuillet. The way it worked was that there was pages 3, 4, 5, and 6, I think, had a figure on it. Then you had page 7 and 8, and I'm not absolutely sure about the pages, but it's something like this. It was a new thing. And then it said, now do 3, 4, 5, and 6. And then there was another figure, and then now do 3, 4, 5, and 6. So clearly, it was a figure, changing figure, and a steady, static figure. Now, that's reversed later in the cotillions, where we have the steady changes and the single figure. Th these are not changes in the same way, uh, at least not the, because they're complex figures. But there is a refrain that is, stays the same, which is what happened in the cotillions later, where the, the, the core of the cotillion, and then we had the standard changes around it. This has seemed to be the core, and then differing changes around it. So it's not there yet, but it's going there. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm, I'm, when you talked about your head spinning. <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah, 
the, the whole thing of one thing stays the same and one thing changes, and in one case it's the figure that stays the same and the chorus that changes, and in the other it's the chorus that stays the same. And the, I mean, is it a question of the words we're using for the? I language? don't think so. All right, so I think I think the early. Let's see if I can rephrase it. I think the early cotillion in in Feuillet, and I, I I probably should go back and look at it again. I think the early cotillion in in Feuillet has a figure. Okay. Then it has another figure. Then it says, repeat that first figure. Okay. Then it has a new figure. And then it says, repeat that first figure. Okay. So basically, you've got one steady thing and the changing group of interesting figures around it. Right. As, opposed, As to opposed to. Now, when the cotillion comes along, the cotillion, each cotillion, has a figure of its own. And then there's a set of standard changes. Everybody, every cotillion starts with a grand round. And in, in France, it's to the right, in England, it's to the left. And then they do a series, and it depended where you were as to what these series were. But generally, a hand turn, uh, left, right hand turn, left hand turn, back to back, star, the men's star, the women's star, uh, allemand usually, and finally a grand ring. Again, round one. Those stayed the same. Now, that's how, when it got to England, that's how it got the, the, the dance that the French imported over to England stayed, except what they did was they took the cotillion thing, added the changes, and eventually the people got tired of doing the changes. So they took a whole bunch of cotillions and put them together, called it a quadro. Left out those stupid changes. Everybody can do those, you know. But, ha, ah, can you do a quadro where you can do the same figure to different, I mean, a different, differing figure, because the different, the, the, the figure of the cotillion. Can you do five cotillions in a row to different music all in one dance? You got to be good. You got to have gone to dancing school. It's a, it's a commodity. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's a commodity. And th that's the way I see it. And, and interestingly enough, I don't think the quadrilles really led to the, to the square dance as smoothly as the French contredance did. Now, when you think about it, the French contredance was being taught as a French contredance, evidently. Not necessarily as cotillions, but cotillions were being taught in, in eastern cities. Some French contradances were also being taught. They, they say, they, the, the dancing masters say, in the 1780s, between the end of the revolution, when the French were our friends, and the XYZ affair in the ni late 90s, when the French were not our friends, things, suddenly French things were not good anymore. But there's that period. And that's when hundreds, of thousands of people came from Europe to East Coast cities. They landed in East Coast cities. And those that wanted to, wanted to find out what the latest dances were, they brought some with them. They shared them, learned them, because they had to meet people, particularly the upper classes, had to meet people. Then they go west and they settle Pittsburgh and they settle Cincinnati and they settle. Uh, and what dance did they take with them? The latest dance, the French contrabass. And you have French dancing masters after the revolution. Only a few. Yeah. There were plenty of English dancing masters teaching French dances. Uh -huh. You can't blame it on the French dancing masters. Oh, okay. It's a that's very crazy. handy crutch. No, okay. but I think a lot of people say that's why. Uh -huh. But that's not why. It has to do with demand. It was the latest. That's what they wanted. So they were learning cotillions and French contredans. Now those are the most elite people that were learning those kinds of things. The cotillions sifted down. Little country people could learn cotillions. But even cotillions had the same elements that eventually became the square dance. Because they had the bowing in the beginning, they had the grand round, and they had the changes. And then the nut, which is the, the basic square figure. Yeah. And so when does the quadrille emerge? I don't think it emerges. It, it depends where you're talking, because yeah. everywhere, um, it depends whether you're in England or here. Um, I blame Thomas Wilson for a lot of things. And he 
he, 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 he must have had a copy of The Dancing Master, one of the early issues of The Dancing Master, because he published some of the tunes from The Dancing Master that, you know, normally people in his period <laughs> didn't have a clue what, there was, what they were. So he must have had some of that stuff. Now, but that's, that's, that's just Thomas Wilson. Chip used to say he'd be a hot hash country uh, square dance caller if he'd lived today because Thomas Wilson was an amazing, amazing guy. But he was at the downslope of the popularity of public dancing schools. I mean, by then, after that, nobody needed to go to a dancing school, although they made sure that they did because they had to learn manners. But um, Wilson published in, I think it was, it's around in the mid, in the teens, the 18 teens, a quadrille panorama. I think it was 1819, which is, oh, oh, maybe 75 figures. And it was a quadrille for 16 people. This is that extraordinary diagram. It's that amazing diagram. Yes, and that's in flat in a lot of places you'll see it. Um, and so that tells me that the quadrilles were out and about. Um, I haven't seen any dance books with quadrilles in them in my stuff. I have two pieces that were called quadrilles, but they don't look much more like a cotillion. I mean, they don't look really different as far as I can make out. And so the English are starting, I mean... Oh, the English started to do the, the quadrilles. The quadrilles come in to all yeah. max, what, yeah. in the mid In the, in the, in the teens, I think, after, in the teens. After, after the Napoleonic Wars and the English could go over to France and... Um, no, France no, and no, I think they're taking cotillions. Uh, they, they are, yeah, they are calling them La Poule and other uh, things like that, yeah. Um, I, I can't, English society, I haven't studied too much. Yeah. You really have to study... Oh, is it getting up to be true? Okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. We'll I, I, they would have been the ones doing them. So talk some That's why no kissing in the school. <laughs> <laughs> kids, kids, uh, kids of families who cared were trained from practically as soon as they were breached. They, once the boys were put in pants, they were sent to dancing school. And they had to learn how to, it depends what we're talking about, when we're period, but the 18th century chiefly up until, say, the 1790s. Once, in the 17, well, society stayed society, but, but be, within America, society began to break down because we just did not have, we were a democratic society. When you don't have a king and you don't have a permanent president, see, people wanted Washington to stay on so they'd have this father figure or king or something. And they were not sure that they were ready for this. But by the 1790s, you begin to have a sense of uh, we are not a hierarchical society. Now, that's not to say I've, I've, read, I've read innumerable accounts, and I've read an awful lot of first-person narratives of the local laird lording it over the others and then saying, you're, on my, you're in my way. Get off the road when I want to pat my cart through and you're just a peon, I'm the squire. And so this kind of thing did happen, and that did continue, and that does feed the need for dance to provide the um, support structure, shall we say, for people to exhibit what they, who they are and what they can afford to buy, what they have the leisure to learn. And so they can go to the assemblies in Boston and meet the better sort. And that kept on. The assemblies kept on into the uh, 19th century. So I, I think the, the idea of dance, and actually when you think about it, going through the 20th, at the, in the end of the 19th century, I don't know a lot about that area, area, but still, dance did separate the classes. If you had the leisure to learn, you were above the others. The time, the money, the clothing, yeah. because, oh, fathers complained about the cost of the clothing back in the 40s in Boston the 40s, for the dance, 1740s, yeah. So the, anytime you're talking about a decade. Oh, yeah, it's, 17, yeah, 17, 17 <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. I don't know much about the 19th century. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the complaints about dancing schools are, are uh, there's a whole book on, on, 
uh, against against the dancing. Uh, that's just full of quotes of people who don't who don't want to play the game, but are being forced into it. Just to Dance it. as a as a competitive sport. Yeah. yeah. And and a way to acquire um, stature, a way to marry off your daughter's hire, that yeah. kind of thing. That was the critical thing. If someone told me once. Whether they were in jest, that one of the reasons Washington became a general, I mean, that will, people were willing to have him as a general, is he was so well known in that social status, exactly. in, part, in that, that tier of society. Absolutely. And you couldn't have anyone who was just a backwoods person running your army, but he was a, he was a dancer. Yeah, but he was a farmer. The British thought he was a nothing. Oh. He was just a farmer. He danced because he had to. He danced because everywhere he went, he had to lead the dance. He had, he had a tin ear. The poor guy must have suffered so. How could he minuet with the, with the governor's lady? And he did. He couldn't. He had to dance. It wasn't because he was a dancer that he was great. He had to dance because that was his expected role in society. And that would be true of any of the other, the governors, uh, any of the other leaders in society. Oh, there is a very, it's an amazing story. It was a guy from Salem, and I've forgotten his name, but he's very well known. He took lessons from Turner in the minuet. He had to learn the minuet in order to take his place as an important person in society. He, had, he wrote it down in extreme excruciating detail. First, you sink gradually with the utmost ease on your right leg. Then you slide. It's in my, it's, it's an amazing narrative. And this from a very, very important person in, in the early days of American society after the Rev War. Huh? No. I forgot his name. And he was, he was from Salem. He was, um, he was very important. He's a lawyer. But his, his narrative of it was, must have been excruciating. He, he never did conquer it. He couldn't have. <laughs> he couldn't have. How Washington did, I do not know. But he danced because he had to. He was not uh, necessarily a great dancer. Everybody said he was, of course. I mean, what else do you say? What else can you compliment him on? Washington, oh, I love that guy. Washington knew how to be a general. And it was, it was the early lessons, I think, in dancing that taught him that. But the presence that he gave is what they teach in dancing school. And it's that erect posture. You're not looking down your nose at people. You're just stronger than they are. You have a presence. And Bob has told me they learned that in the military. And that's why he became such a good general, is this this presence. That is what the dancing masters taught. It was more that that they were teaching than figures of dances. And that's what they advertise that they teach. And they even advertise that if you've come into money recently and you didn't learn to dance when you were younger, they'll teach you privately until you're ready to show in public. That's in the newspapers. So obviously that's the kind of thing the people needed. Well, and that continues all the way into the last century. I mean, Absolutely. People sending their kids to school. It's Absolutely. not to learn to dance, but it's to learn, it's it's to learn manners. We learn uh, manners. We, yeah, I, w I went to one of those schools. Uh -huh. We learn manners. We learn to sit with our knees crossed and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And in a different era, it was for women how to hold your fan. Exactly. What to do with your fan. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So dance is a commodity. You have to think of it first as a commodity. And the dancing masters are in charge of that commodity. And they only respond, they want to see where the money is. And the first thing, they, if they see that things are getting bad and people are, the only country dances around are so easy that people don't need them, they're going to think of something new. And so that's when a new fad comes in. To keep themselves, to keep themselves employed. And uh, Wilson, Wilson is just so transparent about that. In, in his advertising in the fronts of his books, he says, you know, they're, they're dancing so poorly, they really need me. 
And some of the American dancing masters who published in the 1810s and 15s say the same thing, you know, that the peop their people are dancing and they need to come to dancing school. They need to get polished. They need to learn the steps. They need to learn how to do it. So you, you cannot think of dance without understanding that it is a commodity that is responding to public need. And the public needs the dance to, to prepare themselves to appear in public. And, and that's what it's all about. Yes, it's a lot of fun. There's no question. It's a lot of fun. And when you're dancing in a kitchen junket somewhere up in New Hampshire or someplace like that, it doesn't really matter. It might, though, you know, if the squire came by or if you were trying to show off to a girl, it might. So? Certainly, if you were dancing in the court of Louis the Fourteenth. Oh, well, he used it as a political tool, because when he was a kid, he was really frightened. They had this thing they called the La Fronde, where it was an uprising against his father, and it, it they 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 nearly killed him. I mean, they they Paris just rose up against the crown, and they escaped. And when he became king. That was what he was most afraid of, is that the court would turn against him. And so he decided that, first of all, he had a Spanish mother. And so he, he knew what uh, hierarchical uh, presence could do. So he brought, I don't, yeah, as a matter of fact, I think, I'm not sure about this, but I think Fayet was a Spanish. I'm not sure. There's, there's some Spanish teaching coming in to the French court. In any case, he had he established the uh, Royal, Royal uh, School of the Dance. And he said, come up with something that's going to make me look great. Now, I, that's not his words, obviously. So guess what they did? They took the old Renaissance dance, which is everything that started on the left foot. Everything had started with a step and a lift. Okay? I'm going to change that. It's going to start on the right foot. Armies for years marched the left, left, left. No, we're going to start on the right foot. We're going to start with a lift and then a sink. Talk about a revolution. The entire court had to learn this new dance. They didn't have time to go and cock, cock up um, uh, things against him because they had to learn this. They've come into his presence in a new outfit every night dancing these new dances. All because they changed everything. And that's the dance that survived into ballet today. Ballerinas go up, and that's the dance that, that gives us this presence. Now, there was probably presence in the Renaissance dance, but it was much more inward. I haven't you know, gone too much into that. But, but the presence of rising on the half toe in a position of equilibrium that the French dance introduced in the 1660s changed everything in dance across the whole world. I mean, it went to Mexico, it went to uh, Russia, everywhere. That, th that was a big change, big change. So? <laughs> I never heard it put quite that way for the rationale for doing that. Yeah, that was what it was for. Yeah, that's what it was for. So he learned. He learned to do that. Well, they, and, and they, the dancing masters then, created these ballets yeah. using these new steps. That's all in Wendy's book. Using these new steps, these ballets in which he was the son. And so he was a young kid. A young kid. He was in his teens um, and early 20s. And so he starred in all these bands. And dance became the thing that his court was famous for. Now, everybody in Europe and even in America were looking to them for fashion. I mean, they always have. And I think it was Louis XIV's flair that, that made this happen. Once, once this had started, he just took over. I mean, that was, that was the dance of the world, of the cultivated world. Now, there are plenty of dances going on in other cultures that we don't know about that have nothing to do with this. But it'd be interesting to look at other cultures' dances to see if there, I mean, the Indian dances that I worked on with my book, those were also dances of intimidation, which is really what Louis XIV was producing, a dance of intimidation. 
the Indians did dances to frighten the early explorers who came. They wanted them to be scared of them. So they did dances. They were not necessarily dances. They were dances for fitness, but they weren't necessarily dances for fun. The Indian dances were often dances to intimidate the people who were invading their territory. Because of the environment in which they occurred, you begin to read the, the, the narrators. Because all our reports come from the people who saw them, who were from outside the tradition. So, but the people coming from outside the tradition looked at these things and were scared. Which was the point. Which was the point. So we have to be careful about saying, oh, they danced just to have fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have to find out why they were dancing. And if we can, what they were dancing. And I, there's a lot of Indian stuff that I turned up that, that tells you pretty much what they were doing. Um, it's sketchy. It's sort of like this big lacuna we have. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's 1850s. Well, it's, the, it's the curse. The more you know, the more you know you don't know. Absolutely. Right. You see those holes and you say, oh, how can I fill them? Yeah. So if, I mean, and this may be moving to a period that you don't know as much about, but if you've got dance in Louis XIV playing that role, when you have French society change with the revolution and then Napoleon, does the, da the dance must change? I, do, I really don't okay. know. I don't know what happened then because I don't know the sources. Yeah, we're into the wrong century. <laughs> Not <laughs> in my century. <laughs> my, I don't know uh, whether the contradance continued. I don't know. But I, I don't know. I mean, this whole thing is you have to take all this evidence and you have to look at it all. Yeah, Ellis Rogers, I think, argues that, that with the chain with Napoleon and, and his his coterie, that there is a whole different aesthetic and a different, and that the quadrille fits that, mm -hmm. that period and that sort of... Well, that could be. Yeah. It depends what, you know, what the classes, how they're being taught the stuff. Yeah. Um, and you also have... I don't you understand. Have a new you have a, a new generation of soldiers or, or of officers who have come back from the war. Officers. Coming back coming back to England. Yeah, no, we're, we're Officers not. are a major, major players. Exactly. I mean, so you have people coming back to England after the Napoleonic Wars. Yeah. And these are, you have many younger officers, and of course the younger people are always looking for something new and sure. different. Sure, sure. So that, well, that's the, the old style of dance, and we don't need to do that. Yeah. So, so he, he argues that that transition is... Uh, I would foster. look at Thomas Wilson first. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that you married her first, or she'd be <laughs> sitting off in a nunnery, married in spirit, to Thomas Wilson. No, I, I, uh, either he was picking up on a trend um, that, that, I mean, it, this kind of thing, absolutely, it could, could have happened. Uh, if, if, in fact, the quadrilles had happened in France first, um, I don't know that they did. I'd have to see documentation. Um, I'd have to see Dancing Master ads in, in publications if we got them, but I've never seen any. So I don't know. We're way out of my period. Uh, yeah, I certainly, the movement of troops moves all kinds of fans all over the place. There's no question about that, particularly officers, because the officers are expected to dance with the... That's how they, that's how they find both women and, uh, and stuff. They need food, they need water, they need all sorts of stuff. They need new horses and that sort of thing. They've got to get friendly with the local... Um, constabulary. They've got to find, they've got to meet the local mayor, they've got to minuet with the local mayor's wife, they've got to, you know, that's how they establish what they're going to get out of the community. And of course for the lower classes that's how they get their women. Uh, we have lots of diaries uh, explaining how we went off and we danced here and danced there and, you know, that's how they find their women. And, you know, you you can't roll in the hay all, all day. You've got to do something, and so you might as well dance. And so they dance. <laughs> There's some wonderful diaries that are very explicit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, that's what those notebooks are full of stuff. I, gotta, I don't know what I'm going to do with them all, because I don't think New Hampshire wants them. Not all the Xeroxes of 
Well, that's when you, that's when you publish, you know, the, the, the X-rated. The X-rated, the X-rated part. Dan- yeah. The X-rated dance diaries. You have to string it together, though. That doesn't, it's yeah, not going to work. Yeah, no, just bring it together. Is there anything else that you want to? I don't think so. If you're if you're satisfied with what you've got, yeah. <laughs> I wish I, you know, I, I wish I knew more now about what we've got because uh, maybe Allison, you, maybe you can go talk with her. Yeah. Because she's got to wrestle us to the ground because she's working on the Jane Austen book. Yeah. So she's she says she's got to get the history of the Cotillion, find out what happened. So she said my head hurts. I told her my head hurts too. But I think this I think this new book is going to be useful. Yeah. I'm going to I I don't even want to buy a copy, but I got to because I got to know about it. Do you read French? Not very easily. Okay. Not very. Because there's that there's the um, Gilcher. Gilcher. has been somebody apparently has uh, translated it, uh-huh. and I don't remember who. But somebody has translated and is willing to share his translation. Okay, not, not a published. But no, okay. no, it's, it's, it's just, a, yeah, I have a copy of, of Gilchrist. Yeah, I, I, I passed it, um, I found some online mm-hmm. in French and passed it to a friend who, who reads French who knows nothing about dance. Mm-hmm. And we got together and I was talking with Pierre Chartron, um, Quebec mm-hmm. dancing master, who went over to, when he did his master's work, was studying in, in France and said, you know, this is the book. Yeah, but the more I worked with it, um, I used to, of course, I used a lot of the French stuff. The reason I got into the French stuff was for steps, because obviously our steps came from, and, you know, I was working with Wendy and all. So um, I used it for the steps, and it, made, it helped me figure that out. But a lot of the rest of it seemed to come from socks. And I thought, ooh, I don't think so. Um, this is 1966. Somewhere around in there, 60, 66, maybe 60. Yeah. Maybe it's 1960, 62. Yeah, but it was, a, um, it was a dissertation originally, I believe. So it wasn't even a published book. It didn't go through, uh, at least I'm, my understanding is that it didn't go through a publisher, did it? I don't, I've, got, I've got a copy in the other. It's in the bottom of the bookshelf because I don't use it anymore. But I, it, I got what I needed out of it, and I was not, I just didn't find the answers I was looking for. Which was, where the hell did the swear dance come from? <laughs> and I was I've been looking for that too. If I had found it I, just until today, um, I would have grabbed it and put it in my shelf, you know, just so when I needed it, I'd have it. But my, my basic understanding of what happened to the square dance, and I think I've already said this, is that it, it, came from France to East Coast cities and was taken west by the settlers. The reason the Contra lasted in New England was New England was pretty well settled. There wasn't much land left that was arable to be passed around. So most of the communities were doing English country dance because that's what they had grown up with. And so that stayed there. Square dance went west. And, and, that's, and so um, we, you know, we didn't get our square dance from the cowboys. It came from France, <laughs> and it was pretty elaborate in the old days. <laughs> but it's a nice dance. Yeah. But all see, all the marks are there. Yeah. The English country dance doesn't. The English country dance generally does not start with honors to partners. That's that's. Uh, John Millar would like you to think it always does, but it doesn't. And we've never. The honors are when you reach your place. Uh, you honor your partner. Just. And at the end, when you finish a figure where you're not going to be active again, you sometimes honor your partner, just quiet little honors. But they don't have this whole choir dance honoring. That's, that's not part of what they do, at least not to what I see. There is a period, and I wrote about it, I think it's online, where we have a bunch of dances in the 1670s that have a Honor the presence. I was just going to ask. Yeah. I'd never love thee more. Yeah, there are a set. There's a set of dances that have the honor the presence bit. That's a presence, not partner. Yeah. You do the presence and then partner, but the, chiefly the presence. They came in and went out. And I've written. There's an essay on on our website about this, uh, with illustrations. I think some of them were older dances where they added this honor the presence to it. I'm not sure how musically it worked out, but whatever it did, it's there. 
but it disappeared very quickly. It happened just about the time that the Académie Royale de Danse was formed. And so there must have been something going on um, in dance at that, in 1670s. That, uh, you know, let's think what was going on in the court. That that's what we, the next thing you have to look at is what was going on in the court. And um, that's Charles II still. James didn't come in until 82, I think. He ruled until 88 or something. So, and of course, uh, Char no, that's Charles II. Charles II was the one who brought back Merry Old England mm -hmm. and, and that whole Tony Barron story of Merry Old England and the, and the, the uh, Morris dance taking the English, the country dance form and stuff like that. So that's a whole other narrative. So, anyway. So that's the brief window where the. Where There's this, it where, came where and went. Presence. It came and went. Now, the presence features a lot in the early dances. But not like this chunk where there's a line and there's this this stuff added. Yeah, yeah sort yeah. of introductory figure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You look at the, the articles up on our website. Okay. Yeah. That, but that, again, you can study. Well, we got it. Uh, copies of just about every dance, every country dance book that was published. Um, I think towards the eight seventeen nineties and eighteen hundreds, there's few that we don't have, but we've got everything else here. And every every manuscript, and I've got two books of French contradans and a whole book of cotillion stuff. But I haven't found the Grail until this morning. This morning. And of course, when you were talking about you know from the French, that's certainly for the New England style, if you were the quadrille style of, of squares. Mm -hmm. But then you've got the whole Southern Appalachian, you know set running, Kentucky set running, and the big the big sets and things, and and there's a lot of stuff going on there that may well have come from the Scots and Irish who were, who were coming down to, to that well, part. It depends. I don't know what they were doing in the 18th century that wasn't English. <laughs> I mean, the Scottish country dances are all English. But the country dances. The country dances. But whether there's, whether the... They were doing jigs and reels. Yeah, uh, I don't think there were... I don't know of any. So many brawls and things didn't certainly didn't no. didn't survive. I, I my sense would be that stuff like that. You think about t uh, taking the pieces of the square dance, the cir the grand the circles and stuff like that. You could split them off. Yeah. Um, I don't know. The documents of the dance do not support historical s survival of some of that stuff. Now, I can see how New England could be affected by the French coming down later. But in the 18th century and the 19th century, the, the strength was the English country dance. Yeah. And then as the factories... Even, even coming from, from um, Canada at that time, it's an English... It's French an English... Stuff. Oh, yeah. I it's mean, the Eng English... It's the English who have picked it by the French going back over to England and bringing it in. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 The big history... It's, you cannot say this is the way it was. You have to say, in this place, at this time, this is what seemed to be going on. And you can't say, this is where it came from, because none of this is linear. Except you can see the traditions, the trends, and so... Uh, obviously, when the square dance develops into rounds and, as you say, visiting, running sets and stuff like that, it probably started with the germ of the contradance, but then it picked up other things from other places. Who knows where? I mean, don't forget the Indians are doing rounds. So, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think you want to do an Indian dance, but... <laughs> anyway, I think we're getting a little silly. <laughs>